Holland, Laren, Magpies, and Orsons. It's room 442. <laughs> It's a busy one today, not exactly interesting, but uh, here's our picks of the bunch so far. Uh, Atkinson Stanley won Boreham with nil. Those who remember Atkinson Stanley from the 80s will understand why I said it that way. Um, right now it's still in action in their replay. Uh, in the Carabao Cup, Southampton fell to Newcastle 1-0 in the first leg. Joe Linton had a guilt edge chance to make that 2-0, but 1-0 is how it ended there. Bayern Ty Cologne 1-1, one, one, and Lazio just smashed AC Milan 4-0. As I welcome in Albert and Sarah, who can't <laughs> believe... What are you laughing at? We're just looking at the board and Cologne and Cologne. And <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, a, it's a stinker of a day, let's be honest here. Accrington Stanley. Accrington Just Google it, you'll, you'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah, not, not the best, most exciting of days, but, but let's begin by just picking out what, what did stand out so far for, for you today, Albert. Kimmich, Joshua Kimmich's strike uh, for Bayern Munich against FC Cologne Bundesliga. It's about 30 yards out, left foot, 90th minute, ties the game, 1-1 draw, and they keep their lead in the Bundesliga. you got to see the goal. And Alfonso Davis uh, did start that match. He did. Came off. Subbed, yeah. Wasn't great, by all accounts. But, what, a, uh, what a goal. It, it was a great goal. From a, I love a good long ranger. No, I do. It was outstanding. All right, Sarah. It's got to be Lazio beating AC Milan 4-0. And now they're still in third place, but they're only a point behind Milan. This puts Lazio now, sorry, not Lazio, Napoli at the top of the table, 12 points it's clear. Yeah. It's theirs. Well, what's, it is theirs, but what I like is from two to six, all those teams are within a few points of one another, meaning Mourinho's Roma could slide into second place this weekend if they win and Milan and Lazio both lose. I like it. We got a lot going on in the city. Yeah. All down to his genius, too. Yeah. Now, All if he, if he leaves the U.S. Uve. job, which yeah. is rumored, rumored, eh? Jose to the U.S. <laughs> job, man. Boy, but yeah, Roma will love that being a second place. So it's been yeah. a long time since they're a contender in the Serie yeah. Um I'm going to go with, with that Carabao Cup match. I wouldn't generally speak, you know, talk about a Carabao Cup match, but it's Newcastle, it's Southampton. And listen, you know, I know they're one step closer to becoming in, in, in their first major final since... What a very, very long mm -hmm. time, right? It, it feels good. It feels, it feels right. They're not there yet. Southampton are playing better football right now, um, but Newcastle should prevail, I would think, in the second leg back at Newcastle. Oh. Um, that Joe Linton miss, by the way, when you get a chance to see, you, you should take a look. It was just unbelievable. About, what, eight yards out, open goal, hops up, and he skies it over the bar. It was, it was quite embarrassing. Sure, um, no, no chance for Southampton at St. James's Park in the second leg. I down 1-0? So, no. mm. Although they've lost once now in five games. Yeah. Under Nathan Jones. They're playing better football, but listen, Newcastle. No way. We remember when Man City won their first FA Cup in, I think, 10-11. We thought that was the beginning of something really special, and it was. That's, they just had to get that first cup under their you know, mantle place, and, and they did it. And I wonder with Newcastle, they can win a cup this year mm -hmm. if that's the beginning of something, because they'll spend a lot of money in the summer. Um, now to the really important, the important stuff. stuff. All right. Gareth Bale, one of our favorite topics in Room 442, obviously retired from football couple of weeks back now he's announced he's playing in a pro-am golf tournament in pebble beach yes it begins <laughs> gareth bale's golf career he loves golf as you'll be told by most real madrid fans so i thought i'd ask these guys who would be the perfect foursome what are you laughing <laughs> what are you laughing? when you asked i thought we needed to include ourselves in these foursome <laughs> If you want to clear yourself in a force with Gareth Bale, that's up to you. Yes. Okay. So, so. <laughs> all right. Let's start though with uh, let's start with you, Sarah. Okay. Yeah. If you could pick a great force for Gareth Bale at the pro am, who would you have in it? Well, I didn't include myself. I, of course, Gareth Bale is there alongside his long, long friend Luka Modric from Tottenham to Real Madrid. These two are notoriously known as besties so he's gonna want him there and i also went with aaron ramsey another longtime friend of bales who him and bale were known as a dynamic duo at wales and then i went for andreas Villas-Boas because apparently during their time at tottenham together they had a chat that kind of ignited bales you know resurgence and amazing career at tottenham so you know if he could do it there for football maybe he could say a little something whisper it to him and he could become this incredible golfer but all positivity around Bale because that's what he needs when he's golfing I love that you know although Aaron Ramsey might hurt himself <laughs> oh definitely drive down the, the night fairway 
<laughs> Pudding Green, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Or how about who you got in your foursome? All right. So it's, it's just <laughs> Me and the Look lads on a day out. Right, Harry Kane. Okay, you got to have Harry Kane, right? Yeah, well, big a, time if golfer. You're Albert Vatanian, you're right? He, he's a scratch golfer as well. Got the Tottenham connection there. Harry Redknapp. Why are you gonna like Harry Redknapp that much? He loves Harry Redknapp. Well, Harry Redknapp loves Gareth Bale. Okay. Right. <laughs> Another good golfer. And then you got me in there, right? I feel yeah. like it'd be me and Harry against Bale and Kane. It'd be a great day. I can hear some old like Portsmouth stories <laughs> with Redknapp. So yeah, I threw myself. I don't know about I, that picture. I, I love the way. I love the way that you're, you're staring at. Harry yeah, there. I don't know. It's... I don't remember taking that picture. I don't even know if that's me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's you. Pretty sure. I tell you what, they're missing gambling for sure, though. On, oh, on, on that course, for Does sure. Harry and you there. Yeah. Two complete degenerates. I thought about so many different combinations, but right here, this is the perfect foursome. All right, for me, um, I get it a little bit personal as well. So <laughs> see Jimmy Brennan there, former Canadian international, TFC captain. So Jimmy was once upon a time a famous. Brilliant left back at Southampton until Gareth Bale arrived. <laughs> and Jimmy will tell the story how he thought he was getting a new deal, had a great season, but the meeting went a different direction. And he was told, I'm going to sell you, mate, because we've got this young kid, Gareth Bale, coming through. Wow. And Jimmy loves it when I tell that story. So I thought I'd tell it for him one more time. I have Florentino Perez, because he knows the truth behind Gareth Bale and what happened at Real Madrid. He said some pretty nasty things in the past about Gareth Bale, about his commitment to football at Real Madrid. I want to just see how that dynamic works. Oh, you're adding so, the so, so to far, the fire. positivity. I've got negativity with Florentino and Jimmy, who I think we get on really well together, yeah. by the way. Really well together. The drinks together. would be flowing there. Right? Flowing, yep. They'd enjoy themselves. And, and Tiger Woods. You know, we know what a golf nerd that Gareth is. Uh, and if he can learn from anyone, it's going to be Tiger Woods. So uh, I think Jimmy might enjoy Tiger being there as well, to be honest with you. I love the thought that you put Jimmy. into this. This isn't for Jimmy. This, is, this is more for Jimmy yeah. than it is for <laughs> Gareth Bale, actually. Jimmy's foursome. Yeah. It is. It is Jimmy's foursome. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think that'd be an interesting one, you know? Florentino may not be the most greatest conversationist, no. but uh, he'll have some stories at least and explain to Gareth. He just looks like such an unlikable guy. Did it yeah. all go wrong? All right, so that's, uh, <laughs> you can tell it's a pretty quiet day today. We're going through <laughs> golf foursomes in the first block of the show, but it's going to get better, I promise you. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about Erling Haaland, who's been just brilliant, as we know. It is very much the year of the striker. And Albert, he'll be leaving us for the next block, but yes. he'll return later in the show. Mikey's with us right after this. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Kylian Mbappe may have scored five goals in the French Cup on Monday night, but if you're talking strikers this season, it's all about the Premiership. Match day 20 in England's top flight saw four strikers grab the headlines, with Harry Kane, Eddie Nketiah, Marcus Rashford, and Erling Haaland all finding the back of the net for their respective sides. Records were equaled, records were broken, and hugely significant points were gained. First up, Harry Kane. Although he's never won a single piece of club silverware, Kane's match winner against Wolves saw him become Tottenham's joint top scorer of all time. The 29-year-old now has a whooping 266 goals for Spurs, matching the total of club legend Jimmy Greaves. On the other side of North London, Eddie Nketiah is not only wearing Thierry Henry's number 14 jersey, he's also replicating the Frenchman's feat of scoring 90th minute winners against United. Nketiah's two goals against the Red Devils made it nine strikes in all competitions, including four in his last five Premier League matches. And far from being a stand-in, the 23-year-old now has more goals in fewer minutes than Gabriel Jesus managed before being sidelined at the World Cup. Marcus Rashford hadn't scored away from home in the league for over two years, but the 25-year-old continued his resurgence under Eric Ten Hag with a stunning strike against the Gunners. Rashford now has five in United's last six league games, and with nine goals in all competitions since the World Cup, he's the highest scoring striker in Europe's top five leagues since December. City's Erling Haaland continued to tear up the record books with a fourth Premier League hat-trick in only 19 games. That makes it 31 goals in all competitions for the 22-year-old with only half the season played. His 25 goals in the league are already more than Son Min and Mo Salah's golden boot total last season. 
and the striker has amassed more goals individually than almost half of the teams in the Premier League. So with all four strikers on fire, which player will have the biggest impact on the season and which records could still be broken? Thanks, Sarah, as Mikey joins us now. And yeah, if you're a striker right now in England, it's been a pretty good season, right? We'll get to Haaland again shortly. You mentioned Rashford there. Ivan Tony has been great as well. 13 goals in the campaign thus far. They're all bossing European football, at least the top leagues. Yeah. Um, why is it and is it this year the year for the striker in English football? Well, I think a big reason is the guy that we sort of just spoke about was Erling Holland, right? He's setting the tempo right now in English soccer. And then also, don't forget about Harry Kane and what he's doing for Tottenham. He does this year in, year out, but it's being overshadowed a little bit because of Erling Holland. So I think him and then you add maybe a guy like Darwin Nunez, who is supposed to come into this league and really increase the profile of, of strikers in, in English, English football. And I think this is what we get here. It, it's really... I guess an exciting time for English football in terms of goal scoring. The Prem once again getting all the press because of the goal scorers, right? <laughs> and the money goes to the goal scorers. And I mean, look, look at Haaland right now. 25 goals on the season so far. Let's compare that to, to recent years and the overall Golden Boot winner, right? So over the entire season, how have they done compared to this year, halfway through for Haaland? Last year, of course, Mo Salah and Sonny hung 23 goals. 25 for Haaland. Year before, Harry Kane, 23 goals. 25 for Haaland so far. 2019, 2020, Jamie Vardy, 23 goals. Haaland, 25 <laughs> goals. I mean, it really is amazing what he's doing so far. The 30 goal plateau used to be the big one. Mo Salah, the last one to get there. Harry Kane's come awfully close and might well get there again this time, Sarah. But I mean, 25 goals around midway through the season. We're almost, I, mean, I am at this point, taking him for granted. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, just also what like Mikey had said about the league right now. The Premier League right now is the best league in the world. And I think that's why there are so many fantastic players joining or coming through the ranks. Because the thing is, we've seen Leo Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo hit that mark in La Liga. Messi's gotten to 50 La Liga goals, Ronaldo's gone to 48. So I'm sitting here and I'm waiting. I said, Erling Holland, come and join the club in La Liga. But may <laughs> I remind you, La Liga was also the best league at that time. This was around 2012. So now I'm looking at Premier League and I'm like, this is really the league. And now he's doing it. It would be fantastic. And it's incredible. And there's more parity too, right? I think in, in English football, in the Premier League compared to La Liga back in those mm -hmm. days. He's on course for 57 goals. Right? <laughs> 57 this season by himself. Now, let's compare that, to, shall we, to some team totals overall. All right? This is for 2021-22, right? It's last season. The entire 38 teams, 38 games, United there. Just had to get had Manchester to. United in 57. there. 57. So, so, you know, he's on, he's on pace to equaling United's target overall <laughs> last year. Look at Norwich last year. 23 Aww. goals, right? He's going to double that the way he's going right now. Now, is City better with him? That can be argued and debated. I, I think they will be. Mm -hmm. But certainly when you have a guy with just around 20 touches per game, an out and out number nine compared to last year when every City player had what? 70 to 100 touches. Mm -hmm. It does make the team play differently. But do you think right now City are still more formidable with, with Haaland than they were, say, this time last year? It's hard to say, right? I mean, the thing is, he's getting the job done. And because of that, I think you have to say City is better with him because he is scoring the goals. I mean, a hat trick over the weekend, mm -hmm. just like that. And you're saying it also with such so much like less time touching the ball. But every time he does touch it, his ratio is so much better that he probably has like, you know, a one in three chance of scoring. I don't necessarily like the way City plays with him. I think it's much more of a service game to him. And I think they play much better as a team and good football without him. But I think you would be silly to say that City are better without Holland. Yeah, it is an interesting point because you're right. The type of football that they've played has definitely changed. You see Kevin De Bruyne, the first player that he looks for when he picks mm -hmm. up the ball now is Erling Holland, where it used to be sort of by committee mm -hmm. that Manchester City used to score. You can make the argument. I, I, I wouldn't uh, turn it down that Manchester City play worse football now, but it is still really effective when you have someone like Erling Holland. When you have that, you have to use it. And that's what, just what Manchester City is doing. But the issue is, as we've seen, you know, in sort of these last couple of games that they had, is if you shut down Erling Holland, what yeah. happens to the rest right. of Manchester City? Yeah, you know what's amazing to me too is 
we, we talk about Haaland and Harry Kane second with a paltry 16 goals. You look at that compared to the rest of Europe, some of the big players in all the various leagues. Mbappe is leading France right now with 13 goals. Osman, 13 goals in Italy. Lewandowski, 13 goals in, in Spain. Nkunko, 12 goals for the Bundesliga at that point. And uh, look in Portugal, Gonzalo Ramos, just 12 goals. Mm -hmm. Kane smashing all these guys, but no one's really talking about Harry Kane except for Albert Vatania, <laughs> right? Which is so unfair. This guy could finish with 32, 33, 34 goals. Yeah. He could break Shearer and Cole's record, in fact, potentially. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the other guy wearing blue is going to destroy that record. Yeah. Is it because, sorry, he plays for Tottenham? Like, is Absolutely. That... <laughs> we talked about this yesterday. Don't let me go off on Tottenham again. They're so boring. <laughs> Nobody talks about them. Let's get Harry Kane to a bigger club. It's, it's, it's a good point, though. Yeah. You know, if he was playing for Chelsea, well, not Chelsea this year, <laughs> perhaps, but like Man City or United or Newcastle. Yeah. You know, a team in the top four and really playing great, great football week in and week out. It could be, be different. Um, Albert's going to return to the couch <laughs> next block. Okay, Sarah, you're off. Thank you so much. So that was a fascinating chat, but we'll keep doing that before now the end of the season because this record-breaking season is just crazy so far. When we come back, though, we'll talk some Canadians in the news, in particular Kyle Larin and where he might end up if not already. Another week gone by, another big week for Canadian transfers. So who's the latest Canadian to be on the move? Let's find out. The Kyle Laren sweepstakes have come to an end and surprise, surprise, it's not Cadiz, it's not Besiktas, it's Real Valladolid as Laren is reportedly set to join the La Liga club on loan from Club Bruges. Four points out of the safety zone, Real Valladolid are hoping that the addition of Canada's all-time men's leading scorer will help save them from relegation. The deal also reportedly has the potential to become permanent if the 27-year-old striker hits certain metrics. A good move for Laren, and he isn't the only Canadian striker that could be on the move this window. According to Fabrizio Romano, multiple English championship clubs have reached out to the French club Troyes for Ike Ugbo and the 24-year-old is expected to depart the club before the January transfer window. The English-born striker, who came through Chelsea's academy, has been limited to a bench role with Troyes this season, only scoring once in 15 appearances. A return to his native land could be just what Ugo needs to turn his season around. Speaking of moves to England, Canadian international Jade Riviere has signed her first professional contract, joining Manchester United. The 22-year-old fullback is one of Canada's brightest up-and-coming stars, having already earned 36 international senior caps, notably playing a significant role in helping Canada win Olympic gold in 2021. Riviere of Markham, Ontario became the second Canadian woman to join Manchester United, linking up with fellow countrywoman Adriana Lyon. The two will hope to play big roles for United down the stretch, who are currently in first in the Women's Super League. Yeah, Jade Riviere's move to Manchester United comes at a really important time for this Canadian women's national team, obviously getting some really high-level experience over there in England. And around the corner, we have the She Believes Cup, which, as you can see on the screen here, Canada's going to be playing some really top-tier nations in the United States, Brazil, Japan, and Riviere is expected to play an important part in that as Canada prepares for the World Cup, James. Yeah, it's a relevant cup that always has been, right? And this is a massive year for the women's team in this country with the World Cup in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they're based around Melbourne for the group phase. Um, and you mentioned Riviere going to, to the WSL, and so many players are moving over there now, it seems, and how important that league's becoming, not just for women's professional soccer, but for the Canadian team in, in particular. And WSL is still really important as well. We, we know that, you know, Christine's still there, a number of players are, but it just shows how the world's getting bigger right now and how Canada's really benefiting, I think, from the, the professional game. Yeah, for sure. And a lot more teams overseas have been taking notice of Canadians as they are as they continue to make moves over there. Look at a person like Jessie Fleming, right, and see what she's accomplished with Chelsea, right? Manchester United right now, they're in first place in the WSL. 
So Jade Riviere is going to an automatic contender. She's joining Adriana Leon at that club, someone who who's already broken in a little bit and established themselves with United. And having her there will obviously help Riviere get acclimated there. But just being in that environment every day can definitely help transform Riviere into that next step, which is really exciting because she slowly started to take over the starting fullback position from Alicia Chapman at the last Olympics. And at 22 years old, she's one of, I think, Canada's brightest uh, up and coming stars there. Yeah, you mentioned Chapman there, and as she she falls to you know different roles, mm -hmm. we're seeing this new generation really begin to take hold of this team. But of course, the one that stands out is still, I mean, with respect to Sophie Schmidt, who I don't think will ever retire. Um, Sinclair. Yeah. What what is she still going to carry this team on her shoulders? Does she need to anymore? I mean, her role's changing over the years. Yeah. She's not the dynamic force she used to be, obviously. But for the World Cup, one more you think kick at the can, still integral for this team. She is still going to be their starting number nine. She is still going to be such an important leader. But I think even we saw last Olympics, it's no longer the Christine Sinclair show with the Canadian women's national team. Their best players right now, in my opinion, are Ashley Lawrence, Jesse Fleming, Quinn in midfield is fantastic. They are really good good well-rounded squad now and as you mentioned it's not no longer the christine sinclair show uh, you have people up top with chloe lacasse and, and jordan heinema that could potentially fill that void at striker and michelle prince and it's such a good job last uh, last cycle on taking over and and being an option for canada up top it's it's an exciting time for this women's team i think they will make noise at this uh this world cup in in july to the men, Carl Aaron, to Real Valladolid. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Nice. Valladolid? Valladolid. Sarah said that's how he pronounced it, yeah. so I, I assume it is. <laughs> um, listen, he goes to a team that's struggling mightily, just 13 goals on the campaign. Can he bring the goals to this club? Because so far this season, Albert, I'd say no. No, he struggled. Just 13 appearances across all competitions. One goal, not great. Um, and I said earlier, when you asked me on, on, a, on a previous show, what should he do? go wherever the minutes are. So if the minutes are there, it's great, but it's a tough position to be in because Valladolid is in a pure relegation scrap at the moment in La Liga. So yes, he could get minutes, but I'm, I'm worried that the style of football because of the position that they're in is gonna affect him scoring goals, right? They're gonna be more of a defensive team that tries to get points to stay in, the, stay in I was gonna say Premier League, but in La Liga. So it could affect his performance going forward, but if he gets the minutes, that's exactly what he needs. Yeah, still top flight Spanish football, right? Mm -hmm. If it all works out, it's a great move for him, of course. Um, but he has struggled so far. We've seen him score a ton of goals for his country and at club level as well. But at 27, right, he's not a kid anymore. Mm -hmm. He's got to turn this corner, hasn't he, pretty soon? You look at his resume overall, internationally, it's fantastic. Domestically, he's had some grid stints with Orlando. He had a really good stint with Besiktas. But then when he went over to that next level, I think, in Belgium, it hasn't worked out for him. So now he's going to try again here at La Liga. But I'm with you, Albert. When you go to a side that's in a relegation battle, especially in La Liga, you're going to expect that side not to have much possession. Kyle Laren is not the type of striker that loves to feast off the counterattack, mm. right? He likes to get involved and build up play. So we'll see how this works out, but at least he'll get more minutes. At least that's what we're thinking. As for Ugbo, um, maybe to England. He's played most of his career overseas, but of course he's from England mm -hmm. uh, originally. Um, what is his level? I mean, league championship seems to me to be a pretty good fit, and there's several clubs interested, as you mentioned there. Is that, do you think, the, the, the tip for, for Ugbo? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question, right? Because he had a lot of pedigree. This is a former Chelsea Academy mm -hmm. player, just 24 years old, and when he committed to Canada, everyone was super excited because we almost haven't seen a player of his background commit to Canada. Right. So we don't necessarily know what his level is right now. Um, but at this point in time, the championships does seem like a good fit. And I could see him helping out a lot of different clubs. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the window closes in, in a week or so mm -hmm. from now. And I mentioned before, for Canadian football fans, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Not much John David news right now, by the way. It's going to probably happen at some point. But uh, if not this summer, it's not this uh, winter, then in, in the summertime, um, we're out of time. That was Room 442. Hope you enjoyed that. We're back, same time, same place, tomorrow. Cheers for watching.